Graduates Conversations podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations podcast. Today, I am going to be talking with Lisa Tribuzio, who is the manager for Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. Lisa, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Patty. How are you? Very good, thank you, and very good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, let's have a little bit of a chat about the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. Before I started uh, this position at All Graduates, to be honest with you, I hadn't heard of it. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted to do some webinars for aged care, and uh, I found you, and we had a lovely chat, and yep. then you got me on to some amazing people, and we did this webinar series mm. for five webinars. And, um, you mm. know, little did I know about the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. Can you please tell our viewers and listeners what the CCDA is and what it aims to do? Yeah, absolutely, Fethi, and thank you for... Um for mentioning that because not a lot of people do know about the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing and we're always trying to go out there and sort of raise awareness of the importance of our work um, but also the the way in which the Department of Health have supported um, our work. So the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing is funded by the Department of Health to deliver culturally appropriate care and to promote culturally appropriate care within the aged care sector. Um, So we are a part of the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care program or the PCAC program for short. And there is a provider as part of the PCAC program in each state and territory. Mm. The Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing is the Victorian provider. Um, and if you look on the PCAC Alliance website, you'll see the other providers in each state and territory. And each provider is funded to work with the aged care sector around what are the needs of older people from culturally and linguistically and faith diverse backgrounds. Um, how do we reduce barriers to access to the aged care system? And how do we support the aged care sector to be more culturally safe and culturally inclusive? Um, thanks for that, Lisa. Is there quite a barrier uh, with um, uh, aged, uh, aged people, older people from uh, different faith backgrounds, different language backgrounds to access aged care? It's a really good question because there's a number of different um, I guess there's a, there's a range of different issues um, facing older people at large. So if you look at the um, the, age, uh, the Royal Commission yeah. um, into aged care, as well as the recently announced, announced budget um, by the government, suggests that there needs to be an entire aged care reform. Yeah. And so uh, all older people um, require support um, in their own unique ways. Um, and we know that there are quite a few issues in the aged care sector around um, waiting lists, for example. So people that wanting to remain at home, um, there's a big waiting list. So that the government's trying to reduce that waiting waiting list. Um, there is also issues around um, the the workforce. Um, so there's the large scale work um, issues. Um, I won't go into all of them, but if we actually now focus on the issues facing older people who may come from um, backgrounds where they they may not speak English. Um, They may come from certain um, culturally diverse backgrounds and they might be migrants or they might have a refugee background. They might have a faith background that's not the majority of our culture, which is Christian and, you know, Christian culture, for example. Um, So um, there are things that the the aged care sector needs to consider around diversity and inclusion. Um, Sometimes we've noticed that there's massive um, language barriers that older people may face and therefore the system needs to be really um, innovative and advanced in the way that they understand language barriers. Um, So some of those issues are um, the underutilisation of of, interpreting and translation services from the aged care sector, people not being aware that they can access interpreters mm-hmm. for free under their contracts at times. Um, we know that translations are not funded um, by the department under their contracts at the moment. So I think the new budget might be looking at new uh, ways to look at translations. We know that uh, sometimes people use the, the children um, and the family members of older people if they have dementia or they have a disability or hearing impairment. Um, And 
we know that um, families are important. However, if we look at the aged care um, values system, it suggests that it has to come from the older person, that that older person needs to have their own voice. Mm. And therefore, um, we are working around how do we marry the idea of family-centred practice and individualised sort of practice, for lack of a better way. Um, so there's just a range of um, issues, Fetty. I could go on forever, but it's, 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 so, it's so complex and um, each, each person has their own unique needs. You, you, you mentioned a very important thing there. I mean, yes, um, the older person has to have their own voice, but then you also have the family who, you know, probably sometimes knows more about the older person's medication and situation than they do. So we can't, I guess, just say, keep the family out of it. We need to find some kind mm. of a way to have everyone involved and have the older person's voice there as well, whether it be their own voice or through an interpreter. Um, I think it's quite important to get that balance right, isn't it? That's a really good point, absolutely. It's not one or the other. Each case is gonna be very different. We need to be mindful of elder abuse. Mm -hmm. We need to be mindful that it's the older person, what they need in their life, um, what they require. And if they feel comfortable for their family to make a decision on their behalf, then it's their choice for the family to come in. But it's only when it's their choice. And I mean, mm -hmm. when they've got advanced dementia, of course, we need to rely on the families and carers. Um, but again, I think it's case by case. And uh, through these webinars, uh, especially the one oh. about dementia, um, I learned that the first thing that someone loses is their second language. So even if people have come to Australia 30, 40, 50 years ago and they learned how to speak English really well, uh, the, the first thing to go or one of the first things to go is that second language that they've learned. So they revert back to their mother tongue. So even if they have uh, had English most of their lives, um, you know, all of a sudden they go back to their mother tongue and it's like they forgot how to speak English or it's like they never learned it before. So I guess yeah. the importance of interpreters again really comes in there in situations like Absolutely. that too. Absolutely. The importance of understanding how important it is for the right to communicate, that it's not an additional thing to do in terms of health and well-being and um, quality of care that it is an essential part of quality of care. We know that people need their medications. We know that people need food and nutrition. We know that people need, um, you know, all the things that the residential care provides, for example, home care provides. However, language is an essential service um, in relation to the right to communicate. And we recently had a conference um, where we had a language services panel. And um, there's research coming out of Monash University around um, how the aged care sector are using interpreting services and some of the attitudes that have emerged around using interpreting services. And there was one quote around someone from the aged care sector saying that um, interpreting services is not really an essential service, um, that you know, it's more that they have their medications, the priorities that they, that they um, gave to that person. However, we argue different and we're going to be working, I think, with Monash to sort mm. of have a look at that project because we feel that it is essential. Um, and, and we also have had other stories where people that are in residential care have been signing their way every day through sign language when they could simply be speaking Mandarin, which is their language. And, you know, when you think that's, about that's it from so a human... To hear. Yeah. I mean, from a, from a, you know... Mm. You're taking someone's words away. You're taking someone's language away by saying that. So would you do that to an English speaking patient? Would you just cover their mouth up all day or stitch their lips up and say, well, you know, you don't have to speak. All we have to do yeah. is give you food and your medication and, and that's it. You know, you don't really need to speak. Would they, would they ever do that to an English speaking person so that they would go and say that to a non-English speaking person? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Patty. And I think we need to focus on some of the good practice examples. And recently we have had a, um, conversation with an aged care provider in Melbourne's northern region who started Italian language classes in their residential facility because a lot of their residents spoke Italian. And what they noticed after running this program is that the residents started to get more strong in themselves, feel a sense of self-esteem and actually start running a lot of the um, activities and a lot of their memory came back. 
around um, past memories of language in Italy and they started to teach the staff um, what the language was about and correct the staff if they were wrong as well. And um, I think that's a really good story um, because it's about um, learning from each other, um, ensuring that older people are able to express their language, their culture and their identity um, in their home, this is their home if they're in residential care. That's right. Um, but if they're in home care, it's important that we get staff that are culturally sensitive, respectful, and uh, open to learning from the older person as well. And there was always so much to learn from them, isn't there? Um, yeah, I feel that uh, the, the whole concept of ageism has emerged. Um, and I think it's really interesting because in a lot of cultures, Older people are elevated and revered for their wisdom mm -hmm. and for their life experience and are often the centre of the hierarchy. And I feel that um, that's something that we perhaps need to learn from each other, that we all have something to share and um, let's work together to try to help old people to be active participants in their communities. I mean, if there's one thing that's for sure is that we're all going to get old, aren't we? Absolutely. And I think there's definitely a push for more funding and resources to um, into the home care programs mm -hmm. to enable people to stay at home um, for longer. And so that looks like the direction of aged care moving forward. So, so Lisa, in your view, how how's the government's response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety? Um, what can we expect to see uh, in the upcoming years? Some of the findings that have come out of the um, Royal Commission report have been a, a breach of human rights. Um, so one of the things that's come out of the budget is uh, a whole aged care, um, a new aged care act. And the aged care act at the moment is from 1997, from my understanding. So it hasn't changed in, in a while. And that's a, that's a significant. Um, a lot has changed since 1997. Yeah, uh, that's right. I, I, I've yeah. been around that long to tell you that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so have I. And, and, you know, I guess in order for, for them to, to look at an actual the, the, the law, um, suggests that there is massive issues in mm. aged care. Um, we are also um, excited that the government has looked at diversity and inclusion in the new budget um, around more um, funding for language services. So we'll wait to see what happens there. And um, the acknowledgement of diversity and inclusion within core operations within the aged care sector. So we'll see what happens there. Um, the other thing um, to note is the, um, the importance of, um, of supporting the workforce. Um, we know that the wages haven't been, the, the increase of wages for the workforce haven't, haven't been uh, mentioned in the new budget. And um, that's something that's been pushed for quite a while now under the aged care workforce strategy. I'm sorry, the aged care workforce council, um, because people working in aged care um, need, need support. And um, there's also a campaign to attract people to the aged care sector because it's been, there's been a lot of, problems in attracting people and retaining people and supporting people who have very complex jobs around, you know, um, looking after um, people with complex needs, but also being subjected to death and dying, mm. um, being subjected to really complex behaviours around dementia care and not getting the acknowledgement and support that they deserve. Um, in, in some yeah. cases, not getting their hours in the one uh, aged care facility. I mean, we've saw during the pandemic as well how uh, everyone, you know, some of these aged care staff is going from one service centre to the other uh, just to make ends meet as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. There's a casualisation of the aged care yeah. workforce. So there's a lot of um, issues. And I know that that's a whole other lane, you know, that people are going down around. It's it's a whole other, it's sort of not, it hasn't been mentioned in the budget. The budget um, is around supporting the workforce through training, mm. but not in relation to wages. Um, so that's something that was really interesting and yeah, there's um I guess there's some things about the budget that um, have been really positive, but there's also been some comments made from the sector around further funding needed to reduce the waiting lists around home care packages. And of What's course, the waiting further... at the moment? Do we know? Uh, I'm not sure, but we know that there's about a hundred thousand people on the waiting list, and they're going to wow. try and reduce that. And um, we also need to put a lot more resources into supporting culturally and linguistically diverse older people. So that's something we're advocating for. Um, how do you get the word out to the to the older persons, uh, you know, that they have the right to an interpreter, they have the right to translated material? Um, how do you get the word out? 
Yeah, well, um, the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing doesn't work directly with older people. Um, we work with the sector, we work with providers and organisations to help them support older people. So, for example, when we worked um, with all graduates, we tried to talk to the interpreters to let them know that when they uh, work directly with older people, that they can tell them that they have a right to an interpreter. Um, we have our website as well, which is a nationally funded website for a national audience. Mm -hmm. And on there, people can download any of our multilingual resources or our practice guides in order to develop the sector. So I guess we, we work more with managers, team leaders, supervisors and workers mm -hmm. um, for them to be equipped and prepared when coming across someone with diverse um, uh, from diverse backgrounds and with complex needs, I guess. Yeah. Now, I know you're always working on uh, some new projects. Um, what are some of the ones that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, well, um, we're really excited to run our webinar series. So um, we have was, a monthly webinar that was series. Very, very good. That was good fun and uh, very, <laughs> yeah. very influential. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have a range of topics that, so we, we consulted with the providers and we asked what kind of topics do you want to talk about in relation to diversity and inclusion and equity? And um, we responded by launching our monthly webinar series. So our first one was working effectively with interpreters in aged care. Then we ran another one around um, accessing multilingual and multicultural resources, which was run by the PCAC Alliance. Our third one was effective translations in aged care and then applying a diversity lens to dementia care. Um, and the one we have on Wednesday is cross-cultural communication. So it's sold out. Um, hopefully we'll get some more webinars in the future around that topic, cross-cultural communication. It's been a very interesting topic. Um, as we know, we've got a very culturally diverse workforce and a culturally diverse um, client population. So often the client population might come from um, post-World War II migration or uh, say, for example, um, East, Eastern European or Mediterranean or um, you know, uh, even now coming through, like, let's say, um, Asian backgrounds or Vietnamese backgrounds or Chinese backgrounds, for example. But the workforce itself is, doesn't necessarily match the cultural diversity of the client population. Um, so there's a language mismatch there. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes there's issues um, that are, are, are faced in the aged care sector around um, the way in which older people receive information from the workers. So we're running that topic, cross-cultural communication. And then after that, we've got um, creating inclusive organisations and then linking inclusive practice to the aged care quality and safety standards um, and a, um, inclusive, um, inclusive consumer feedback, which looks at the fact that a survey is not going to get feedback from older people, um, that we need to reach out to older people, talk to them um, through a range of different methods, um, and that a survey will simply exclude people's voices because not all older people can read. And secondly, um, and we have a massive digital divide. Um, in order to go onto the internet and look on a website and download something and fill out a survey or give a complaint to, to a provider or give feedback or a compliment, um, it's very hard for a lot of older people, especially if they've got language barriers or health literacy barriers. So one of the things we're doing is called the Consumer Voice Film. So we're going to be um, launching a film in July um, which helps older people to understand what they can ask in the aged care sector. It's going to be translated into over 15 languages. And um, things like, can I have an interpreter? Um, can I make a complaint? Can I make a compliment? Um, that's all going to be, um, it's going to be our film that will be targeted to, to the client population and to older that people. Sounds great. Excited about that. Yeah. How are you going to get these videos out to the communities? Well, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we'll promote it to the sector again. So we're going to go through the gatekeepers and the people that work directly with older Magnificent. people. Magnificent. Well, let me know when it's ready. Happy to mm -hmm. share it Thank around you. as well. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all you do as well. Um, tell me and a little bit about... <laughs> thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the COVID-19 older persons uh, multilingual hotline that I've been hearing about yeah. recently. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, Very exciting project. It is, it is. It's been um, quite an interesting experience with that project. But basically, um, last year, the, um, the government, the Department of Health, launched its um, COVID-19 Older Person Support Line in English. And 
the PCAC Alliance um, suggested that perhaps we could have a, another program model which looks at a range of different languages so that people can call and speak their language rather than go through an interpreter. And it was approved. We wrote a proposal and it was approved and we called it the older, um, the Multilingual Older Persons COVID-19 Support Line. Um, so we have it in six languages, um, Arabic, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Greek and Italian. We have multilingual phone support workers and it's a partnership with all graduates, Spectrum and Spectrum, um, Migrant Resource Centre. So it's exciting. Um, we First of its kind, isn't it? <laughs> so you can just pick up in your language, in these six languages, and mm. then speak to someone mm. on the other end mm. directly, and then hopefully yep. they sort things out for you. Yeah, and I guess it's still, it is, I guess, a pilot program to see what program model is most um, responsive to the caller's needs. And I think that when someone calls and they can hear someone speak their language straight away, they feel um, relaxed about it because... You feel empowered too, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, and um, we are noticing that the callers um, are wanting COVID-19 updates, um, things like can they travel overseas and visit family members, um, information about vaccinations, um, and that they also like the fact that they can speak their language. So we're going to evaluate the program. It finishes the end of July, but it might be further funded we're not sure oh, i hope so Sounds yeah like thank great you great initiative yeah and um we also think that multilingualism is important across a range of different sectors uh, we know that services australia has a multilingual phone line for people that want to access information about pensions and uh, centrelink benefits or services australia i guess i'm not sure they call it centrelink anymore but um, we don't really see any other multilingual phone lines across any other sectors, whether it's youth sectors, disability. Um, and we also know that people don't feel comfortable always to, so people don't always feel comfortable to call TIS, um, translating and interpreting services, which is often the language um, mm -hmm. provider that's linked to government contracts. That's right. Um, yeah, so if you call TIS, um, it's in English. So it's you hard just have for to them. yell out your language, basically, yeah, don't you? Yeah, and therefore we 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 suggest that um, that multilingual phone lines or support lines or programs at large um, need to be considered um, across the whole health and community sector. In a country like Australia, we have so many different languages being spoken, and so widely across communities. Um, you know, it's the year 2021. First of all, congratulations on this initiative, but also I'm thinking, you know, uh, why why is it the first time that something like this is being done? I mean, you're saying <laughs> Services Australia is doing it, but I think you're right. It definitely should be much more broadly um, administered, I think. Yeah. Um, we know that people also rely, some people also rely on trusted resources. So phone lines don't always work because it's a stranger. However, with time, if we embed it into our culture, it'll become normal. Mm. And not everyone has to rely on, on a person that they trust, that they can actually rely on the system. And that's what we want to achieve. That's right, because they are calling the system. It's not like they're calling the interpreter line and then hopefully that they understood and an interpreter gets hooked up and then they get hooked up to someone else. They can call the source directly and just speak in their language. Uh -huh. and, you know, uh -huh. That'll, I guess, give them uh, confidence to keep relying or, or keep trusting the service as well and uh, you know yeah. instead of getting their news from who knows where they can go direct to the source like everyone yeah. else would yeah absolutely it gives people equal opportunity to speak their language and speak naturally uh, well I hope, I, hope, <laughs> I hope that's the that's the way it works um, Thanks, so well good luck with that initiative and thank i do you. hope that you get further funding it sounds like a great initiative um lisa thank you so much for joining me today i had a great time chatting to you as always Thank and you, I'm really glad that we got the word out there about uh, who the <laughs> Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing is and what you do. Um, and I think uh, I know that you said that you don't work with interpreters, translators directly, but you definitely do work uh, in the same sector and uh, you would um, have a direct outcome in, uh, you know, how especially professionals or aged care professionals work with interpreters and translators, like you were saying. Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, for interpreters and translators, uh, are there some useful resources on your website that they can access as well? 
Absolutely. Um, if they wanted to know more about the aged care and disability sectors, they can go onto our website under service providers and there's a range of different things they can read. There's a lot of reading. Um, there's a multilingual um, resource page, which is a page with up-to-date multilingual information about a range of different topics. So we encourage them to navigate themselves around, around our website. We've got our practice guides as well. Um, and our newsletter. So subscribe to our newsletter, which gives good practice examples and up to the information. Thank you, and of Lisa. course, if you're on LinkedIn or Facebook, we've got our page as well, which has weekly good practice examples. And you've got the YouTube channel as well, right? Yes, yes, we have our videos on, yep. on our YouTube channel. Um, we're just about to upload our recordings from our conference. So um, yeah, so you'd be able to, to watch those, yeah. All right, well, uh, practitioners uh, and everyone out there in the aged care sector, you heard it from Lisa, get onto the YouTube channel. There's uh, some new material coming out there as well. And um, I had a look at the website uh, earlier on and there's quite a lot of information there as oh. well. Um, so yes, plenty of reading. Um, so get on there and have a look. Uh, Lisa Trebizio, Manager for Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you so much for acknowledging the work that we do and we're always open to a future collaboration. So thanks, Fetty. Likewise. Thank you so much, Lisa. All Graduates Conversations Podcast.